have a lot of participants coming in. And we'll go ahead and start. Again, Goati Kaitawa Hapa, Yushinome Kutu Tuwitsa Kohayahano. Good morning, everyone, and greetings. My name is Bianca Mitchell. I am from the Pueblo of Acoma here in New Mexico. And um, I want to thank you again for joining us today for the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association's webinar, Building a Native Agritourism Ecosystem. For those of you who are not familiar with IANTA, I want to give you a little bit of information on who we are. Um, IANTA has served uh, as a national voice for American Indian nations engaged in cultural tourism for nearly two decades. In addition to serving as the voice for Indian country tourism, IANTA provides technical assistance and training to tribal nations and native owned enterprises engaged in tourism, hospitality and recreation. Um, IANTA's mission is to define, introduce, grow and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. In addition to, addition to webinars like this, in participation with the George Washington University International Institute of Tourism Studies, um, IANTA is presenting an online cultural heritage certificate program designed to help tourism professionals and tribal planners hone their cultural tourism skills. The program will run from January 11th through February 28th, 2021. Registration is open and you can um, view our website at ienta.org for that information. Um, we also provide educational opportunities for tribes through our annual American Indian Tourism Conference or AITC. Uh, the 2021 AITC event will be held in Fort McDowell, Arizona at the Paw Casino Resort on October 25th through the 28th next year. Again, please visit our website at ienta.org to learn more about our program offerings. Um, I'd also like to thank our partner, the Native American Agricultural Fund, for supporting today's webinar session. So today's webinar, you will learn from the owner of DX Beef and the DX Ranch, Kelsey Duchino, Cheyenne River Sioux, and how her passion to help consumers reconnect with their food source led by building DX Beef into a native agritourism ecosystem and how sharing her skills and culture with guests resulted in the DX Ranch. And before we begin, we have um, a few poll questions for you. So if you can all see the poll here, we are asking you to describe yourself and check all that apply. Um, if you're a producer, farmer, rancher, tourism professional, business owner, manager, nonprofit, government agency. And then the question number two, how often do you work with agritourism? And of course, these are multiple choice questions. And number three, how is the COVID-19 pandemic impacting agritourism, including direct sales of farm products? Moderate to negative, um, no impact, moderate positive impact. We'll go ahead and give you a few more seconds to answer these questions. And thank you all for participating in our poll this morning. All right. We still have a few attendees filling out the poll questions here. But again, thank you for joining us for the Building a Native Agritourism Ecosystem webinar today. And I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So we have about 13% that are producer farmers and ranchers. 38% is tying um, with tourism professionals and government agencies, welcome. And then researchers at 31%, educators 13%, nonprofits are at 13% and business owner managers at 13% as well, thank you. And then how often do you work with agritourism? Majority work with agritourism occasionally at 44%. 
And how is the COVID-19 pandemic impacting agritourism at a 41% moderate to negative impact? Thank you again for participating in our poll this morning. So at this time, today we have with us Kelsey Ducheneau, who is a fourth generation tribal rancher that calls the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation home. She's the owner of DX Beef LLC, a direct to consumer regenerative beef operation. Kelsey is the Natural Resources Director for the Intertribal Agricultural Council, a national nonprofit organization that promotes the use of Indian lands for the benefit of Indian peoples. Kelsey serves her community in many ways, from board president of Four Bands Community Development Financial Institution to state committee member for South Dakota Farm Service Agency. She was also awarded the Bill and Melinda Gates Millennial Scholarship in 2011, which gave her access to a worldly education. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Rangeland Management from South Dakota State University and her Master's of Agricultural degree in Integrated Resource Management from Colorado State University. Kelsey is currently in her second year as a doctorate in education candidate with North Central University. And at this time, please welcome Kelsey Ducheneau. Kampatu Ashte. Just a real quick check. Can you see the mugshot of me up there? Am I sharing the right one? Okay, perfect. Ampatu Ashte, Tatea Akwalali Lakotia Imachiapi, Na Kelsey Ducheneau Washichuye Imachiapi. My Lakota name is Soft Little Breeze Woman, and my English name is Kelsey Ducheneau. I am a rancher on the DX Ranch located here on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation in North Central South Dakota. Um, I also get to serve as the Natural Resources Director for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. Uh, we're a national nonprofit organization that works to promote the development of Indian agricultural resources for the benefit of Indian peoples. I'm very passionate about the mission and the work that the IAC has done and that I've been able to be a part of in promoting across the country. And um, really so much of the work that I've done here on the ranch or in my professional life so far, or my personal life so far, um, has been kind of me deciding to put my money uh, where my mouth is or to like, you know, put myself in the driver's seat. I ask Indian producers all across the country to develop these businesses or to sell their product direct to the consumer or to get enlisted in our IAC American Indian Foods program. Well, it didn't really seem right for me to be asking that of people when I hadn't done it myself. <laughs> so a lot of late nights, a lot of weekends um, spent working on promoting some of the projects that we're going to talk a little bit about here today. Um, I wanted to get started with sharing a video clip that um, Bianca and Gail shared uh, or were able to find of our webs of our um, ranch online. And they said they love this clip and uh, I am Angus crew put it together. They did do a phenomenal job of helping to capture our story and to tell it. And I'm going to go ahead and share that video next here. The Lakota people have been tied to this land and I definitely feel that tie and that connection with not only my family and the animals that exist here now, but with the plants and the animals and the people that have existed here for centuries. I feel a connection with the traditional sustainability that the Lakota people used to embody in their lifestyle. The Lakota Nation was a great nation which realized all that this land had to offer from the plants which provided medicine and food for us and ways to practice our ceremonies to the animals which it was a home for, like the buffalo and the eagle, and now the cattle, which we are fortunate to raise on my reservation. In the Northern Great Plains where we live, one thing that we have a lot of is grass. This land was really designed for a large cloven hoof animal. 
Traditionally, there were nomadic Native American tribes which followed the buffalo herd from up into Montana, down into Kansas, all the way as far east as Minnesota, and then all across South Dakota, North Dakota, and even into Wyoming. So there were roaming herds of cloven hoof animals on this land long before myself or my dad or my grandpa were here. Sometimes the similarities of managing a cattle herd and the roaming bison herds are lost, but we really try to capture that in how we manage our pastures, how we manage our grass, and how we let the cattle graze. We try to keep them in a herd as much as possible and reinstill that herd instinct so that they can impact the ecosystem the way it was designed to be impacted. Um, and then we also monitor our pasture utilization so that the cattle mimic the moving buffalo herd and certain lands are given rest and certain are given pressure at the right times depending on the plant community. Our cattle herd is really selected for calving ease and we really look for a good solid disposition in our cows. My dad has really allowed me to take part in the management decisions that him and his brother have made about our cattle herd and I think it really has allowed me to grow as a horseman, as a cattleman, uh, and as a young lady that is confident in being able to go out and do whatever it is that my passion drives me to doing. For me, being a fourth generation rancher is getting to know the first and second and third and fourth generation that's been here just by knowing the land. Whenever I feel lonesome from a grandpa, I can just ride across the prairie and it's like he's right there with me. My grandfather's pride and joy that he left behind was in our horse herd. He also bred our horses for disposition first. That really has been a highlight to ranching in South Dakota is getting to utilize that horse herd that he left behind as part of his legacy. One of the most prominent lessons that stands out from my grandfather was that, you know, family first. Uh, and our family isn't just those that we're related to, uh, it's everybody. And our Lakota culture teaches us that, you know, really everything is connected from the inanimate objects like the rock and the soil to the animals that we get to raise to utilize those resources to us. And our job as ranchers in the Great Plains is to not mess that up. The Lakota tradition is really to care for everybody. That originally may have been foraging for foods and sharing your bounty with those that are less fortunate. For us now, we get to bring people together over our beef. Our management influences everything that is involved in this circle of life. It really does hold true to the cultural aspect of us raising our cattle here. We live on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation, which is one of many food deserts across Indian country. We have thousands of people that have to drive over an hour to get to any form of fresh produce or a grocery store or even a convenience store in some locations. The quality of Angus beef can help to fill the gaps that are currently still existing in our food system and that's why I feel my job is so important. Being a cattle producer, it's knowing that 30 miles away there are kids that face hunger, there are kids that face not having a meal on their plate tonight. I believe that the current barriers which exist that have prevented economic development on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation can be broken down through enhancing our agricultural industry. And I think it is incredibly important to get our youth engaged in that agricultural industry to show them that the wide open spaces out here aren't just the middle of nowhere. There's grass growing there and that grass can be utilized and it can raise some of the best beef in the country and there's room for a career there. And I really hope that we can help to foster and inspire young individuals to go out and to pursue that career path. I've learned over the years that this land has a really cool story to tell us. From riding up onto the top of Scatter Butte and seeing where my grandpa used to ride as a young, young child, to find his cattle herd over a vast 50 mile area with no fences, you know, to down by the river where our tribal community used to be before Lake Oahe was dammed. To me, there's a really, really unique story that can be told on this land, and right now we're able to tell that with beef.
see if I can get to the next slide. <clears throat> so you heard me talking a little bit. Just to check, Gail, can you hear me okay? Yes. Correct, okay. All right, so you heard me talking a little bit about Granny and Poppy, uh, my grandparents, and they truly are, in my opinion, the love story that started it all. My grandfather, Wayne Ducheneau, the first purchased um, the ranch that I get to now call home from his dad. And um, back then we were looking at the entire ranch having three or four pastures on it. And since then we've really done our part, I feel like to um, invest in the infrastructure that's necessary to better manage our land resources. But, um, and we'll get to that in a little bit here, but quite frankly, um, what Poppy instilled in us was a love for the land and our people. And what I think Granny instilled in us was um, our, our love for our family and our need to continually do what we can to inspire and create that home that our family always feel welcome at. The bigger the family, the better. Um, I just was sharing uh, with the crew here earlier how hard it's been not having the ability to open up our home to everybody this year. Um, with COVID hitting, I feel like one of the hardest impacts on our operation um, isn't necessarily directly related to the financial impact. While that has had an impact on our operation, it's been the social impact. Um, not being able to connect with our local youth um, or share with our family from afar the love of this lifestyle that we get to live. This was a picture from our 2019 branding that we had here on the ranch. And our Christmas comes in July when we gather all of our cattle up and we work them for the year. We have family come from all across the country, honestly, to visit, um, to attend, and to help us get the work done that week. Uh, we try to make sure that work on the ranch here is fun. Here's one of my favorite shots of our mare herd trotting in for um, some oats. This is, like I said in the video, my grandfather's pride and joy, his legacy that he left behind with us. And they quite frankly are um, the reason we're able to do what we get to do here. Um, they're a phenomenal tool and resource for us and a partner in um, this life that we get to live. I wanted to make sure and go ahead and, and share a little bit of background about myself to help you understand how I got to where I am. And so I just have some pictures of me on the ranch while I do that. I attended South Dakota State University where I moved five hours away from home to learn that you could get a career in agriculture. Um, when I got there, there was an entire college dedicated to agriculture and biological sciences. And I chose that college because I thought it sounded cool, if I'm being completely honest. I had no idea that there was um, such diverse industry surrounding the promotion of our food systems. I returned home mainly out of homesickness, <laughs> but also because I felt like I had learned so much at school that I wanted to get back out on the land and to apply it. And so I pursued an online master's program that allowed me to continue to broaden my knowledge base and understanding and identify ways to continue to contribute and give back to our operation here on the ranch, but then located me here at home so that I could get out there onto the land and practice and, and grow as a steward myself. I currently am the fourth generation ranching on the DX ranch. Um, we are a cow-calf ranching operation, and we primarily um, raise a Black Angus cow herd. There's um, quite a bit of influence of other breeds in our cow herd, but really what we hope to do is refine a cow herd that is fit to the ecosystem. Um, so as little input as necessary, as little labor as necessary, because we really think that if you're selecting for the right traits in your cattle herd, they should be able to do all those jobs on their own. So a little bit of context, um, the DX Ranch is in the Northern Mixed Grass Prairie, kind of right there would be my best guess on that map. <laughs> 
Um, and here we are on a map within South Dakota. You'll see the yellow um, pretty much right up until this line is uh, <clears throat> the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. Um, and then we've got our sister reservation, Sanding Rock, to the north of us. And oops, let me get back to where I was at. Sorry about that. Right in here where this arrow sits is where the ranch lies. So we're on the southeastern edge of the reservation and we're only about 10 miles off of Highway 212, which is kind of considered like an interstate of um, north central South Dakota. It's a very well traveled road. Um, and so it's a kind of a byway or a a pass through that can generate some tourism interest or, you know, it's the path that um, people would have to take in order to come across our place. We are responsible for managing around 7,000 acres of land. Um, a large majority of these acres we uh, lease from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. And um, we are engaged in a multi-year lease uh, responsible for managing this land within their regulatory authority. On our ranch, we have um, now four brothers that have a home here and a sister. I forgot to include her in there too. Um, but five of um, the seven children that my grandma and grandpa had uh, call this place home right here. Um, one of them passed away uh, several years ago, and the other one uh, ranches with her husband not too far from here. So we've really tried to figure out ways um, because of the large amount of people wanting to call the DX Ranch home, we've tried to identify ways to better refine our use and understanding of managing and utilizing these resources. Um, we have, as you can see here, all of the yellow fence line, all of the yellow um, interior lines are the fence lines. So I mentioned that at one point we were operating on this land um, that my grandpa had purchased and, or um, my grandpa purchased the, the home site here, but the range unit is, was his uh, original range unit. And that is, um, that used to be three pastures, the entirety of that. So as we've continued to go from one year to the next, we've worked to enhance the infrastructure to be able to segregate the pastures a little bit better so that we can really utilize our cattle herd to better influence and impact the ecosystem the way that it was designed to be impacted. Now we've got some pictures of um, what I think is truly one of the most beautiful ecosystems. Um, the Northern Great Plains has just so much vast diversity. And um, even, you know, within one day, I joke, and it's quite honestly true, we can have every season within one day in South Dakota, <laughs> it'll be snowing, and then it'll be sunny and 70 by afternoon sometimes. So we have this really unique, robust ecosystem that we have to figure out a way to exist within, and to manage within. We have a, a fairly slim growing season. Honestly, it's typically from April to um, early October. And then we slip into our dormant season where we're no longer experiencing this lush green grass, uh, but we transition into um, a winter wonderland usually. Uh, I'm looking out the window right now and you know we don't have any snow on the ground yet. It's really not, it's kind of atypical for November. We um, have seen anywhere from, you know, average snowfall from, you know, 20 inches to way more than that. Um, there's stories where the snow drifts are as high as our houses and they have to um, bring snow plows to up and down our road from both directions to try to get people to town. Um, so we really truly have a, um, diverse weather pattern that we have to learn um, to navigate, but diversity does not just exist within um, the weather and the cattle and the livestock and the wildlife. It also exists within the people. Um, here we have a picture of one of my nephews who is on um, my favorite horse, Pommel, and um, this was his first big gather on the ranch, and he's a third grader this year. So 
the diversity and the people here on the ranch and what we all have to contribute I feel like really mimics the diversity of our ecosystem. And that's a resource that we have to work every day to balance and to manage on the ranch here. Human resources, um, especially within family ranching operations or any sort of family business, I feel like is a concept that cannot be overlooked. In 2013, we were able to, um, we actually had almost an entire herd dispersal of um, some of our cattle and so that we could establish and build an all weather indoor equine facility, which is basically just a really large barn <laughs> with a living um, section to the barn on uh, kind of the, oh, the northeastern edge that my father built his home within. And that's a silhouette of the barn there. And here's the indoor part of the barn. And really what this barn created for us was a facility in which we could start to deploy some of the practices and the thoughtfulness in um, sharing our lifestyle year round. Within the 100 by 200 foot riding facility, uh, we, we hauled in some sand so that we could um, have more uh, equestrian based events in the in the um, in the center. We don't really have a focus at all on competitive events, but more so youth and community engagement. And in the sand there, you'll see probably um, one of our favorite aspects of the ranch. And it says Project Help. And Project Help is a 501 C3 nonprofit organization that we have established here on the ranch that um, is really our vehicle for engaging with the local community members and the local youth and trying to get back to doing what I said in that video where we try to share with our youth the robust opportunities that exist within a career in food and agriculture. And this is how we do it here locally. This is a picture of youth that attended our STEM camp in 2019. Um, you can learn more about our, our nonprofit on projecthelp.org. You'll notice that help is spelled H3LP. We've used Project Help to um, raise funds by collaborating with local businesses in the past. Um, some phenomenal, phenomenal support um, shows up whenever we seek sponsorships or fundraising support from the local businesses. And um, it, it really is heartwarming to see everybody come to the table to raise funds for a good, um, you know, for a good cause, a just cause, a way to give back to the youth. And Project Help is just really fortunate to be able to kind of be the vehicle in which we um, give back to the youth. Here we've got the youth uh, from our 2019 STEM camp out um, geeking out about plants and soil <laughs> with me there as their instructor talking about plant identification and different indigenous plants that exist on our landscape that um, really are their resource base and their asset as a tribal member. Here we're doing a soil um, infiltrate, a water infiltration test. So we're talking about the importance of our soil resource base underneath of the soil are underneath of the ground level. The picture that we see above ground in the form of plants is only half the picture. And we have to consider how robust and rich our resource base is below ground. And I like to get into the classroom too. I promise most of these pictures were taken on different days. It just seems like I really like that shirt. But um, it, this is a unique collaboration that we get to do almost every year that's not COVID where we get to go into the local school, Teoshpaya Adopa School's um, summer school program, and we get to engage with the youth. Here we were doing an activity talking about the difference between shrubs, forbs, and grass-like plants. So everybody that had a forb was supposed to raise their forb up, and um, we related the story of the plant's life cycle to the medicine wheel, and you can see that on the um, chalkboard back there. And we really just like to try to get conversations about food and agriculture and our resource base on our land started as young as we can. But we are, 
we recognize that with Project Help, we can't be the permanent fixture of an organization that serves youth most often, largely because the ranch has a growing demand of our time and we all have off farm incomes and professional work that we do day to day. So we don't try to fulfill that role of being the permanent fixture or constant contact organization with, an organ with the youth. We just work to support and encourage those organizations that are, like our local school systems, the different youth groups and youth centers that are um, based throughout our native communities here on Cheyenne River. Here, just having more fun with youth, talking all about plants, geeking out. And here's a picture again um, while we're out doing our resource inventory. Of course, you'll see that the horse head <laughs> is in our logo. So um, while we do a lot of outreach and engagement around the concept of food and agriculture as a career path and community involvement, um, we like to talk about our philosophies surrounding the practice of thoughtful horsemanship. We think that if we can convey a message of how to connect with this large 1000 pound animal and we can empower a youth to know how to connect and engage with this animal that doesn't understand language and only understands body language cues, um, that we can help them to feel more confident and have some self-actualization and understanding who they are. And and their ability to connect with people as well. We think it's all related and we call that relation lifemanship. Here's some pictures of the youth putting that lifemanship to practice horseback. And we appreciate that this is a lifelong learning journey. And quite frankly, there is not really enough professional development learning opportunities on throughout most of Indian country, um, but we'll speak specifically to Cheyenne River, um, there's not enough professional development learning opportunities for our young people. So we utilize the, or we established an internship project um, program within our uh, project help nonprofit. And this internship really works to target local native youth that have participated in our day-to-day -day activities and then taken off in understanding the philosophies or the concepts, or they've really put in the, the extra effort or the work for showing up consistently. And um, really they've earned the responsibility that comes along with a full-fledged internship with our nonprofit. And they get identified as an internship uh, or an intern or a youth mentor that um, starts to help us in instructing the youth. So you'll see actually, um, there's a couple of interns. The one in the back is got their hand up. They're raising and pointing and giving instruction, <laughs> really taking on that responsibility of being a young leader. And we feel that this, you know, is a void that we're able to help fill in our communities by providing this learning opportunity. And I think that it's really critical as we talk about tourism and, ag and agritourism in Indian country, we figure out how to engage the youth. And even if it's a non-paid internship, giving them something that they can put on their resume is so critical. And quite frankly, it brings an energy and an excitement to the workplace that we can't really bring <laughs> on our own. Our internship program though is really twofold. Um, we have our local nonprofit internship and then we offer a um, internship on the, the DX Ranch side of things that is targeted at college age students, not necessarily from Cheyenne River, but from anywhere in the country that would like to have an equine uh, science focus in their internship. Here are several of our past interns pictured. Uh, they come in and they spend anywhere from, you know, six to 10 weeks, depending on what their internship requirement um, timeline looks like learning with us here on the ranch. Um, they get put right to work. It's a lot of hands-on participation in ranch management sort of work, but really focused around the concept of practicing that horsemanship and that lifemanship philosophy throughout all of what we do on the ranch or in helping the neighbors on their ranches. This has created a really unique opportunity for some cross-cultural engagement. 
where we have non-native college students bringing their background and experiences into the setting of our ranch where they um, essentially directly commingle and engage with our local tribal youth. And we've seen some really unique friendships and relationships um, take place in mentoring um, from the college age youth to our local tribal youth and helping to really appreciate and understand that, yes, not only did Project Help show me that there are um, career opportunities in food and agriculture, but I met this individual who attended North Dakota State University and they got a degree in natural resource management and I can do that. You know, it helps to bridge those gaps that currently exist. Now, building upon that, um, let's focus a little bit on the agritourism that exists on the DX Ranch. Here is a picture of my brother. Um, he's in the blue cap. And um, some of his friends over the past winter break, um, they were here doing a couple of days in the life of a rancher, um, enjoying their time, um, feeding the bulls. That's what they're caking the bulls in the background right there. But we really like to open up our ranch as often as we can to others that don't have the privilege of having this lifestyle and learning through a variety of mechanisms. Um, one of them is the trail rides that we offer through um, the local um, country club here. Uh, they contract with us or they connect their um, clientele with us when they have a party of individuals that would like to come do trail rides and get out of the barn and go explore the prairie a little bit. Um, we truly use a lot of this agritourism as a mechanism to offset the cost of um, all of the other functionalities that exist with running a ranch, maintaining the, um, ma maintaining the riding facility for project help, or even setting aside some funds to be able to contribute to the expansion of our project help programming. We Sorry, that's not supposed to say trail rides. That's supposed to say ranch vacations. Um, we also offer private ranch vacations for um, individuals that would like to spend a couple of days actually working on a ranch and learning about the lifestyle firsthand. Uh, this is not necessarily, you know, we're we're not really along the lines of like a dude ranch where you you know you get on a horse and you you follow the leader sort of thing. You know, we want to get you out there learning um, all about animal health and the animal health practices that we have. You can dive deep into understanding how we run our direct-to-consumer beef business. We're happy to really tailor your experience to what your interest areas are and to make sure that you walk away from your vacation refreshed, but also educated and with an appreciation for the lifestyle that our farmers and ranchers uh, carry out across the country. Uh, Jen Zeller on the ranch offers uh, the South Dakota cowgirl is how you can find her on social media. Uh, she offers photography clinics with some of her colleagues and partners within the industry. And um, they really truly are some of the photographs. Here's one of them that has come from the photography clinic. Um, capturing some of the unique and beautiful scenes that you'll see across the ranch, but they're tailored again to meeting you where you're at within refining your own photography skill and enhancing it and getting to where you would like to be and talking a little bit about the business aspect of running a photography business as well and knowing um, how to value your work and how to you know be an influencer within the space of social media use of your photographs. And then probably one of our favorite components of the agritourism is our horsemanship clinics. Um, this is uh, another photo that was captured during a uh, during the photography clinic, and but you'll see a lot of horseback riders there. Quite frankly, the riders almost outnumber the cattle. <laughs> but we did have here in this picture a couple of individuals that were, you know, more or less over the course of their time with us that week, learning different horsemanship principles or practices that we deploy. And this was an instance where we got to, you know, go out and gather cattle and the um, horsemanship uh, participants got to actually practice 
and um, develop or, or um, expand upon what they learned. And we have offered um, retreats. I, I didn't actually put a real picture from a retreat here, uh, but if you're looking for like a getaway or an ability to um, unplug our staff development or training, you know, that is an area where we'd really like to be able to continue to expand our efforts here on the ranch. We do have some bunk houses that are available for rent um, where typically our ranch vacationers and our clinician clinic participants stay. This could very easily be turned into an opportunity for um, an all staff retreat or a, a family vacation or getaway that um, allows you to really explore the great outdoors throughout the experience. And then we do have businesses on the DX Ranch that are a little bit separate or even, you know, maybe be managed by a different, or a different resident of the ranch, or they are um, directly contributing to marketing our products that the ranch grows. Uh, Bud Ducheneau with DX Woodworking designs some really beautiful um, handcrafted wood frames and wood furniture. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, this is my uncle and his family. Uh, lower left-hand corner is the nephew that I talked about earlier being one of our top cow hands out there on Pommel. And then um, my beadwork business, DX Designs, is a um, way that when I was at college in Brookings, five hours from home, I just really had this um, longing for home and I decided to get started in beadwork and kind of taught myself how to do loom beading. And it really felt like a therapeutic way to connect and to continue to tell the story of my culture. And it truly was a very um, relaxing pastime and it allowed me to um, put my energy towards something productive while at college and it has turned into a business for me that we um, have available. Uh, you can see uh, DX Designs on Instagram or Facebook as well. And probably the one that I'm most passionate about is DX Beef LLC. When I returned home to the ranch, I learned very quickly that I was a soil and plant nerd, but I did not have the ability to impact the land the way the land craved being impacted. As a human, I could not go out there and influence the resources the way that cattle can. So I joined the ranching operation and then I learned that basic ranching as the industry has described it or allows it to be, is not profitable at all. And you better have a job in town to help offset the expenses because the cattle markets are not great. Uh, but quite frankly, what I learned is how much I loved getting to know the personality of every single one of my cattle that I had bought. And um, they were my relatives, you know, they're my four legged relatives. And it was absolutely heart wrenching for me the first time that I went to the sale barn to see my calves be sold. Uh, it was, I was disappointed, obviously, that, you know, the market always decides what they're going to bring. That was not the worst part for me. The worst part for me was knowing that I would probably never see them cattle again and not knowing what the rest of their life was going to be like. I pride myself. I pride our ranch on quality stockmanship and quality consideration of our cattle's well-being. And when they leave our ranch, I can't guarantee that the remainder of the industry is going to do that for them. In addition to that, we have people on our reservation that don't have access to a quality protein source. And I really recognized a potential in developing DX beef to serve as a direct to consumer marketing option for local community members to purchase beef for us to tell our story and for us to market our product and provide a life, a full life to our cows that was a little more conducive to a life that they were worthy of, in my opinion. I think that happy cows should get to be happy cows right up until the day that they get to go feed a family that's in need. And so DX Beef has been kind of my baby that I've um, worked to 
grow and brand and market on the ranch to contribute to the marketing of our cattle for the DX ranch in the form of meat. Uh, we are a small value added business that is owned and operated by me. Uh, I feel like we're driving local, more resilient food systems for communities while promoting more economic stability for agricultural producers. Uh, I hope that DX Beef can serve as a case study that is a track record for success for other farmers and ranchers of Indian country to adopt. Um, we have too many food deserts across Indian country and more than enough potential to fulfill the need of feeding our communities in Indian country. Uh, we just have to figure out the right path forward to doing that. Um, and what DX Beef has found <laughs> is starting a food business in Indian country there's no how-to guide for dummies out there. So it's a lot of trial and error. A lot of mistakes are made. Um, a lot of ups and downs to the business of it and what DX Beef hopes to serve as and a part of why we are so happy to join on these sort of calls is so that we can share our story and hopefully help others find a shortcut to success. We've had to do a lot of work on informing our customers, lo consumers locally and helping them to understand um, as a direct to consumer beef customer, what that means, how they can buy their beef, what they need to know and what they may want to know about their product. And this revenue model works on our ranch because you know we are the producer DX beef and we directly relate get our product to the consumer or it gets to the consumer through one of our wholesalers. This has been a significant um, driving impact for our economic impact throughout COVID because um, you know, people are afraid of going into densely populated areas right now. And when you consider how densely populated of areas our food sources come from when we go to the grocery store to purchase, um, it, there's absolutely a more appealing feature to the home deliveries, um, the doorstop drop-offs, the um, socially distanced pickups that DX Beef is doing as opposed to um, other opportunities for purchasing uh, protein here locally right now. The products that we've offered, we found matter. There's different types of purchasing based on the needs of our consumers. And there's different price points at which our um, wholesale retailers are going to be able to afford our product. We are very proud of Yvetcha Watecha. They are a local food business owned and operated on the, in Eagle Butte, South Dakota on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation. Here's some pictures of their gorgeous food. Uh, Sherry Ducheneau is the owner. Uh, she's a native woman uh, that started out in this food truck in the lower right hand corner. And there she is with so much pride and excitement and her smile in her kitchen of her cafe that opened about a year prior to COVID hitting. She was one of the first and still is one of the most consistent customers of DX beef using uh, local grass-fed Cheyenne River sourced beef in her kitchen. This has been an opportunity for us to continue to enhance our community engagement. We've found ways to, um, as if we are to generate a profit, we figure out how to directly um, get that profit back into the community, whether it's shopping local with every dollar that we have or making local donations to families in need. Um, there is a local uh, foster home that we are going to be able to provide with the freezer of beef here this winter. Uh, there is also a, an appreciation bundle that we were able to give to our frontline workers throughout the impact of COVID just to kind of appreciate all of the work that they're doing to help keep our family and homes safe. You can learn more about all that I had to share with you today at dxbeef.com, uh, the dxranch.com or projecthelp.org. I do encourage you if you are a food or egg producer or a business owner within Indian country to also check out indianag.org, which is the Intertribal Agriculture Council's website. Uh, their annual conf our annual conference is coming up. It's the first full week of December, the 7th through the 10th. And registration this year is free for our entirely virtual conference. So I encourage you to go register. 
uh, hopefully right after this webinar so that we can continue to engage and visit at that time. We are available on Facebook and Instagram as well. Just give us a search. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach directly out to me, Kelsey at dxbeef.com. Gail, I think at this point, I'll turn it over to you and you can go ahead and give your presentation. I will pull your slides up now. Thank you for that presentation, Kelsey. Um, so we'll go ahead and have Gail Shehak, our IENTA Outreach and Membership Coordinator, just talk a little bit about what IENTA is doing in um, Native agritourism. So um, at this time, go ahead and take it away, Gail. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, thank you, Kelsey. That was an amazing presentation. I, you really are one of the best examples of agritourism in Indian country and um, an inspiration to, I think, other ranchers and farmers about what you can accomplish by adding the tourism element to your farms and um, ranches. So we're really excited about our agritourism program and working with ranchers and farmers who are feeding their communities and are willing to share their lifestyle with visitors. It's been wonderful finding out about all of the great programs that share their agritourism with um, travelers. So just a quick background in um, agritourism Indian country. There are 59 million acres of land that's engaged in food and agriculture and much of the products actually leave the lands and their communities. Agritourism is one of the ways to add another revenue stream that stays within the community. Tribal farms are some of the largest in the Southwest and Western United States, with uh, Navajo Nation having the largest contiguous farm in the United States. Next slide. We just recently released the um, case studies in, agri in tribal agritourism. We hope that these examples of successful agritourism programs will inspire people to consider adding agritourism to their farms and ranches. As you can see, the um, we profiles six different um, programs, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, Yoka de Hay, Wintu Nation in California, the Icy Strait Point, um, Huna Clinket in Alaska, the Pueblo Santa Ana in New Mexico, Big Apple Fest operated by the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and the Iroquois White Corn Project and Seneca Nation of Indians in New York. In addition to the um, case studies, there are some uh, tools that will um, help people develop their um, tourism. IANTA also operates NativeAmerica.travel. Could we go back one? As you can see, here's our profile with DX Ranch. We also have um, Dynamite Hill Farms and a number of other um, wonderful programs. I was really impressed with Dyna Dynamite Hill Farms. Their tourism just came organically. They said people heard about their farming and wanted to know more about it. So before they knew it, they had visitors coming and touring the farm, having meals with them, 
and they sort of grew their um, tourism project naturally. Next slide. We have an agritourism resource page on ianta.org. On it, you can uh, download the agritourism, agritourism case studies. We also have um, a sampling of some of the um, listings on nativeamerica.travel, some of our articles from our agritourism blog, and then resources, including the Intertribal Agricultural Council. Next slide. Here's Steve Larice, who is a travel journalist who um, wrote up the case studies and is currently um, writing profiles for NativeAmerica.travel. We use NativeAmerica.travel to introduce attractions to tour operators and travel media at international travel shows. Next slide. We've planned some more agritourism webinars, and it's a topic that will be covered throughout our webinar series. Um, you can find out about the webinars on ianta.org in the What We Do um, tab. And that's our program. If you have any uh, questions or would like to be profiled, um, give us a call. Um, you can reach me at gchihack at ianta.org or our um, writer, Steve Larice at gmail.com. Thank you all. Okay, again, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Gail, for today's presentation. And I did post uh, most of the um, links to the website for Kelsey's presentation, as well as the IANTA resource page for agritourism. And for any membership information, please reach out to Gail Shehak. Um, her email address is gchehak at aienta.org, or visit our website and join us uh, to become a member. I do want to um, address a couple of questions here. We have like three minutes. Um, there's one question here from John Kilia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Um, the Washus have a grant member wants to start a program for autistic children and young adults. This is a working ranch that is losing money due to mismanagement. Do you have access to horses with the appropriate temperament for therapy? I am building I am a building designer planner. I like your idea of housing for program participants. Your ideas and thoughts for your presentation. You want to answer that, Kelsey? Yeah, I, I'll give it my best shot. Thank you for the question, John. I think that it's really important, um, and I'm really happy that you asked about the appropriate temperament for the horses. Um, disposition is 100% key when it comes to establishing an equine therapy um, uh, operation. So you're on the right track there. Um, I would love to connect with you offline to identify ways that we could either put you in direct connection with horse programs that we know of that are training horses for this, um, or even share some of our training philosophies and principles surrounding that, that we've utilized um, to make sure that our horses are, are ready and our humans too. Um, humans are a big component. You have to have the on hand um, on the ground staff working and knowing how to appropriately engage with the horses and the youth. Uh, we are not direct. We don't um, identify any of the work that we, that we directly deploy here on the ranch as therapy. Um, we more so focus on life skill building because nobody here on the ranch is um, registered or certified of, of the therapy variety yet. However, um, hippotherapy is proven to be a phenomenal way to engage with um, youth with different learning styles or disabilities, or even as an intervention method that helps to really reprogram and 
redirect energy that some of our higher energy youth have. So would love to visit with you more about that. Thank you, Kelsey. And that's all the time that we have. If we have any other questions in the chat box, um, we can address those offline. And we will be um, posting the webinar on our IENTO website and we'll send the link to all of our participants through email. Um, again, please follow us at ienta.org slash webinar for future webinars hosted by um, IENTA. If you are not a member, again, I did post the information in the chat box. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here today. Again, thank you, Kelsey, and you all have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.